from the University of Cambridge, and uh, he's been there ever since. He's now a professor there. Um, so, I'll give it to Richard. Thanks, Roger. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's really great pleasure to be here. So, thank you very much to the organisers for putting together such a such a great program. Uh, so, I'm going to be speaking about um, a topic that's received really an enormous amount of attention in statistics over the last. Uh, 15 or 20 years, that is variable selection. Um, it's work that is a joint work with, with Rajan, like the last talk, um, but it builds very much on, on a paper um, by Nikolai Meinshausen, who gave the last talk, and, and uh, Peter Bullman. And Peter heard that I was speaking at four, so he decided to get an early taxi to the airport. Uh, okay, so, yeah. Um, I think you, you, you could trace this... Uh, at least a, uh, the short version of this story is you could trace the sort of history of the recent work on variable selection back to uh, Rob Tibshirani's 1996 paper on the lasso, uh, where he looked at LY and penalized uh, least squares um, optimization, so, so trying to fit high dimensional linear models, although perhaps he didn't have the, the kind of scale or, uh, of the dimension in mind that we have nowadays. But his um, the sort of great observation uh, was that if you do this L1 penalization, then you end up with some components of your, um, your estimated parameter vector being zero, and so you can do this automatic, simultaneous uh, variable selection and parameter estimation. And then there's been, uh, if you sort of look at this vast body of work that's been done since then, it's, you could sort of crudely categorize it as belonging to, to two groups. On the one hand, people have looked at much more general models, so you go from the linear model, which is the most explicit thing where you can uh, make the most concrete statement, and then people have started looking at generalized linear models or additive models or partially linear additive models or varying coefficient partially linear additive models, generalized varying coefficient partially linear additive models, and you can sort of imagine the way that this goes. And then, on the other hand, that, that uh, people look at sort of different sorts of penalty functions you might try to use, uh, and explore the properties that the resulting procedures have. So you go from sort of L1 penalized regression to um, the elastic net or um, the adaptive lasso or um, SCAD or MCP or CELO. There are probably several other penalty functions that I, I'm uh, either forgotten about or unaware of, so I'm a, sorry if I've forgotten someone who, who's invented one here. Anyway, stability selection is not in itself a variable selection method, but it's, um, it's one that you can sort of bolt on to any existing uh, variable selection technique uh, with the idea of improving its performance. And the sort of great advantage of it is that you can use it in conjunction with any uh, base variable selection procedure and any underlying data generating mechanism. So it, it's tremendously general in its applicability. Um, the idea is very, very simple indeed. It's just uh, you, you apply your favorite base selection procedure to subsamples of the data, um, and then you aggregate. So you, you, do, you do this for many different splits of the data into subsamples, and then you eventually select the variables that keep getting chosen over and over again uh, on, on, on each of these subsamples. Um, so in uh, Nikolai and Peter's JRSSB discussion paper from three years ago now, uh, they introduce this idea and they have a particularly attractive feature of this method where they're able to prove a finite sample up a bound on the expected number of falsely selective variables you end up with for, through this procedure. And the idea is that this, um, you can use this upper bound to, uh, to determine the threshold of the, the proportion of times a variable has to occur on each of the subsample in order for you to choose it eventually. Okay, so let me set this in a slightly more concrete setting. Um, actually, the, 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 the sort of uh, the model I'm assuming is very, very straightforward indeed. I just assume that I have some data, and for now I'm going to assume that they, these are IID random vectors. So, so um, I, I'm going to think of some of the components of, of these random vectors as being signal variables and some of them as being noise variables. Although, rather interestingly, I don't 
not going to worry too much about precisely what I mean by signal and noise in this uh, particular talk, and I'll, I'll come back to that point a little bit later on once I've talked about uh, a bit more about stability selection. But if you want something to, to imagine something a little bit more concrete, you can imagine that, that our, uh, each of these random vectors can be partitioned as a covariate uh, and response pair, perhaps with a covariate living in some p-dimensional space where p could be very large and a real valued response. And you can imagine that you have some log likelihood or pseudo log likelihood of the form given there where, uh, so you've got some um, uh, linear predictor entering the, entering the model here. And if that were your, your model, and I'm not assuming it is, it's only as an illustration, then of course your signal variables would be the, the components corresponding to non-zero non uh, coefficients and the noise variables would have zero coefficients. And just so that we can fix our terminology, if I uh, fix a subset of the variables, uh, then my um, selection, uh, sorry, my, my, my signal variables are a subset of one up to p, my, my set of possible variables and noise variables as a complement, and then a variable selection procedure is just a statistic taking values in the set of all subsets of, of one up to p. So this is representing the variables that, are, that I eventually choose. Okay, so let's write down in mathematical terminology uh, what we mean by stability selection then. Uh, one more piece of notation it'll be convenient to introduce. If we've got a subset uh, of, of 1 up to n, so I'm going to be subsampling rows of my, my data, uh, it'll be convenient to write s hat of a for the variables I select when I apply my base procedure s hat subscript uh, mod a to that particular subsample of, of, of the data. Okay, so that, that's what I'll call s hat a. Um, and then Nikolai and Peter's idea is to define this quantity pi hat of k. So for variable k, pi hat of k is the proportion of times that variable k gets chosen over all possible uh, splits of the data in, into subsets of size n over 2. Uh, I'll say a little bit about why n over 2 in, in, in just a moment. Um, but so, so we're averaging over all those possible n choose n over 2, subsets of size n over 2, and, and count the, the proportion of times that variable k gets chosen. And then we fix some threshold, and we eventually keep uh, the uh, variables that could get chosen a proportion at least tor of the time, so if, if our threshold's tor. And that's what I'll, I'll, I'll write this superscript ss for stability selection to denote that, that set of selected variables. Okay, so why n over 2? Um, well, I, I don't want to claim that this is the only thing you could do by, by any means, um, but one sort of loose motivation for it is that you can um, think of it as rather mimicking the bootstrap. So the bootstrap would, of course, be taking uh, resamples with replacement. Here I'm thinking of subsampling the rows without replacement. Um, but you can imagine them both as, as um, in, in a slightly more general uh, bootstrap framework is sort of exchangeably weighted bootstrap schemes. So for the usual uh, non-parametric bootstrap, you end up weight with, with exchangeable weights having a multinomial distribution, n, 1 over n, 1 over n, 1 over n. And you can think of these, um, these subsampling as also belonging to that kind of exchangeably weighted scheme. Um, well, if you think about uh, the, the, the sum of the weights is, is n in both cases, the variance of the, of the weights uh, for the non-parametric bootstrap would, would be very close to 1. And if you think of subsampling, then you can do a simple calculation and show that the variance of, of each weight is, is n over m minus 1. And that's converging to 1 if and only if the, the, the subsample fraction is converging to a half. So in, in this sense, my, my claim is that uh, subsampling with, with sub, uh, uh, taking subsamples of size n over 2 is kind of most closely mimicking the bootstrap amongst all possible subsample fractions you might choose. Not that necessarily that's an optimality criterion in itself, it's just that we know and trust the bootstrap. So um, it seems like a, a, a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so, so here is a, a description of um, Nikolai and Peter's ma main result, giving this finite sample bound. The finite sample bound holds under two conditions, one of which I regard as very strong and the other as very weak. So the strong condition says that 
this set of random variables, this is the indicator function of whether or not variable k gets chosen by my base procedure when k is a noise variable, that set of random variables is exchangeable. So that's maybe uh, a little bit hard to, to process what that's meaning. It's saying that the, the joint distribution is invariant to permutations of, of, of those variables. In particular, that would mean that they all have the same distribution and the same mean. So that what that's saying is that every, vari every noise variable would have to have the same selection probability. And so that sort of gives some indication as to why I regard it as a strong condition, because typically we might well imagine that, that uh, some, there are some variables which are, some noise variables which are highly correlated with signal variables and therefore have a reasonably high chance of being selected, and some variables which uh, are not so highly correlated with signal variables and therefore would have a lower chance of being selected. So uh, the, to impose this uh, assumption that they all have the same selection probability, I, I think, is, is strong. The weak one uh, just says that the, uh, the base selection procedure is not, not worse than a random guess. So you end up picking at least as much of the, the, uh, the same, uh, at least as much of the signal, as many of the signal variables, as you would if you ignore the data and just chose them at random. Um, so I think that's fairly self-evidently uh, not, not too strong a condition. And then, so this finite solvable bound says that provided our threshold tor, this is a, uh, the threshold on the proportion of times that um, uh, a variable ha has to be chosen in order to, uh, uh, on, on subsamples in order to be chosen eventually, provided that threshold is bigger than a half, we can bound the full selection rate, that is the expected number of noise variables that get chosen by stability selection, uh, with a, a bound that depends on three things here. Uh, one of the interesting things to notice immediately is that you've got this P, the dimension of the model on the bottom of this bound. So the larger the, the model, the, the, the smaller the, the bound. That's kind of interesting because it suggests that we have some sort of blessing of dimensionality, which is very uh, counterintuitive to, to statisticians. Uh, you can explain it, of course, because if you have an awful lot of variables, then it's unlikely that any individual noise variable will keep getting chosen uh, often enough on the, on the subsamples to uh, get chosen eventually by stability selection. Um, uh, of course, you don't really ever get a blessing of dimensionality in statistics. And, and what we're doing here is we're only looking at one of the two types of errors you, you, you might make. So there's a false non-selection rate as well. And clearly, that's going to uh, deteriorate as, as, as P uh, increases. But at least on this side of the bound, for, the, for this sort of bound, as P increases, uh, then, then you do improve the bound. So the other terms that are involved on this right-hand side, you've got uh, the, 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 the threshold level appears in the bound. And so the higher the threshold, uh, the, the fewer variables you're going to choose, and therefore the uh, smaller the false selection rate. Um, and the other uh, quantity is the expected number of variables that you um, that, that you choose on each of the subsamples. So that's something that's within the practitioner's control here. Okay, so um, I, I, I like this result very much. Um, the idea is that it can help you to choose the tuning parameter Tor. So Tor really is, is playing the, the role of the regularization parameter that's controlling the trade-off between false negatives and false positives. Um, and the idea is that you but as a practitioner, you, you, you think about what level of false selection rate you're, you'd be prepared to tolerate, and I think that's something that's meaningful to a, to a practitioner, as opposed to in the lasso, if you ask a practitioner, what value of lambda is a good one for, here, for, for, this, for your data? I don't think any practitioner is going to have a, a clue about that. So this is something that, that's meaningful uh, for, for a practitioner uh, to, to kind of uh, give some guidance on, and then you know P, this is within your control, so you can choose Tor to control the, the full selection rate at, um, at that particular desired level. Okay, so as I uh, uh, mentioned, that there are, well, there are three potential sort of drawbacks of, of uh, actually using this result in practice. The first one is that, as I mentioned before, you've got these two conditions, and one of the conditions is, is, is certainly a very strong one. The second one, which I think is probably the least important of the three, is the fact that um, in order to compute pi hat of k, 
we've got to compute an average over uh, n choose n over two subsets. Uh, and of course, n doesn't have to be very big, like, like 20 before 20 choose 10 is a really pretty big number, and this wouldn't be feasible. Of course, the solution to this is, is very straightforward. You're just going to take capital B subsamples, but the theory doesn't apply directly to that version of um, the procedure. Uh, the other uh, point that I think is quite important is that the bound tends to be rather weak, so you think you're going for, you, you, you think you're tolerating uh, one full selection, but actually uh, you've got much better control than you think, and, and you pay the price on the other side in terms of the fact that you don't select that many variables if you're, if you're not careful. So you have a high false non-selection rate. Um, so these are the, the, the things uh, about uh, the, the methodology and the, and the theory that we'd like to try and work on and improve if we can. Okay, so the, in terms of the, um, the first bit of the methodology, the, the changes it, that, that, that we propose is just a very, very minor one. Um, just instead of sub taking uh, random uh, B random subsamples, we're going to say, well, whenever you apply um, your base procedure on one subsample of size n over 2, we're also going to apply it on its complement. Okay, so this is why we're going to call it complementary pair stability selection. Uh, you might as well assume that, that uh, n is even for simplicity, and, 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 and that, that way um, we don't have to worry about integer parts of n over 2 and things like that, but it's easy to get around if you, if you really want to worry about that. Um, so uh, having chosen our, our B complementary pairs, and I will explicitly now sort of incorporate the fact that we're not going to go through all possible uh, complementary pairs, but just uh, randomly subsample B of them, then we're going to do, do the same sort of thing. We're going to define pi hat B of K. So this is the proportion of times that variable K is chosen amongst the, the two B uh, subsamples, and then select variables as before with this threshold tor. So we choose the variables k that, that appear, uh, appear at least a proportion tor of the time. And then you can think about trying to prove um, analogous bound on the full selection rate. But there's a point that I want to make before I do that. And um, it is, is the way we get around the exchangeability condition. So I want to try and remove this exchangeability condition. And so one thought you might have is that if you're using stability selection, it's contingent on a choice of, of, of base procedure. So you're kind of, you're limited in terms of how well you can do by, by how good was the original base procedure. If your original procedure is, I'm going to do a random guess, then clearly by subsampling, uh, applying on subsamples, you can't hope to do any better than a random guess. Now, um, in fact, so it, it, it sort of makes sense to define these quantities pkn, which is the probability that uh, variable k is chosen by our original base procedure. And so instead of trying to estimate directly uh, whether we have signal or noise, we're going to think about estimating these fundamental quantities for us, these pkn's, the selection probability. So all we can hope for by using some stability selection type of uh, procedure is that by using stability selection, um, we end up uh, selecting variables that have high selection probability under the base procedure and not selecting the ones that have low selection probability under the base procedure, rather than worrying about whether we end up selecting signal or noise, because we're contingent on the uh, performance of the base procedure. So for us, we're going to introduce a, a set of low selection probability variables, which are going to be a sort of proxy for noise, um, and then a high selection probability variables, which of course uh, proxies for, for signal. In fact, what you can imagine is that um, the, the base procedure is also trying to estimate this, this pkn, but it's doing it with an indicator function. So it's estimating this probability by the indicator function of k being chosen. Now that's of course an unbiased estimator because this ex expectation is by definition pkn, um, but it's uh, potentially got rather a high variance. What we're going to do is we're going to be, uh, but using the subsamples, that means that each of our, on each of our subsamples, we actually have expectation pkn over 2 rather than pkn. So we have a biased estimator, 
But what we're hoping is that by doing the averaging procedure over all these different subsamples, we can reduce the variance and therefore end up with a better estimator of these selection probabilities. Uh, so you can, I mean, the procedure is very much like bagging or, or sub-bagging. And it works rather well because of the instability in the indicator function. It's, it's rather a non-smooth function. And so you can do well by averaging and, and, and um, the effect of the subsampling is rather like smoothing. Okay, so uh, our analog of this bound, which holds without the exchangeability and random guessing assumptions, is that the expected number of low selection probability variables that get chosen by complementary pair stability selection can be bounded above by a quantity, well, rather similar, you've got the two tall minus one as before, and then on the right-hand side, you've got the expected number of low selection probability variables uh, chosen by the base procedure. So that's like a, our sort of false uh, selection rate here. And then you've also got this theta appearing. Uh, so theta, you want to think of as being something like the, the average selection probability over all variables. So, so um, if you use Q, as I will later on, to denote the, the number that you're choosing on each of the subsamples, then you might think of theta as being about Q over P. Okay, so that's the, the sort of proportion of variables you're choosing in total. Um, and that, that, so if you think of that as being Q over P, then the P goes on the bottom here, and it's rather similar to the bound that, 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 that we had before. Um, as well as the, the bound for the false selection rate, you, you've got a bound for the other, on the other side for the, the false non-selection rate. Something that's a little bit inconvenient uh, for us is the fact that the ranges of tor for which these two bounds are valid are disjoint. So you don't actually have any single value of tor for which you have simultaneous control of the false selection and false non-selection rate. That's a point I'll come back to a little bit later in, in the talk. Okay, so let's think about how you might apply this. Um, I don't think by any means nowadays it's extreme to think of P being a thousand, uh, and things only get better for me if P, P is bigger than this. Um, but let's imagine that we choose 50 variables on, on each of the subsamples. So I'll, I'll write Q for the, the number of variables chosen on, on each subsample and say that's 50. So uh, if we apply complementary pair stability selection with tor equals 0 0.6, which is above our 0.5 minimal va value of, of tor, then what that's saying, uh, if we think of theta being Q over P, so uh, tor is 0 0.6, so one over two tor minus one is five, okay? And theta here would be 50 over 1,000, so that would be overall, uh, you've got uh, 0.25. So what you're saying is that on average, you choose uh, complementary pairs stability selection chooses less than a quarter of the low selection probability variables chosen by the original base procedure. Okay. Um, and, and that's, I, I think, I mean, you could certainly, uh, without being at all extreme, uh, get that fraction a quarter down to, to much smaller things. Uh, so as I, uh, as I said, you, you've got no exchangeability or random guessing conditions. Uh, one aspect of this that's kind of interesting is, is the bound holds even with B equals one. So even if you only choose one uh, subsample of size N over two, apply your base procedure to that and its complement, then this bound still holds. Maybe that's sort of giving you some indication that the bound could be improved uh, because you'd expect B to, imp to appear in this bound. You'd expect to be able to do better as you choose more and more subsamples. Uh, so as, uh, when we try and improve the bounds, you'll notice that B does enter the bounds, and, and uh, I think that would be more in line with what you'd expect. But if these, the, the, these two conditions, the exchangeability and random guessing conditions, do hold, then you can recover um, something that directly controls the, the, no, the, the, the number of noise variables that you choose. Um, in fact, the bound that, that we end up getting is just a little bit uh, tighter than the original uh, bound that, that Nikolai and, and Peter ended up with. Okay, so I want to be a little ambitious and prove this bound. Um, it's only two slides, and I claim it's uh, really very elementary. So that's uh, why I'm going to try and do this. And also because um, there's a key step in the proof that really reveals some, something to us about how we might try and seek to improve these bounds, get them tighter, and therefore get a more realistic trade-off between false negatives and false positives. So. We're going to start by introducing this quantity pi tilde b of k, 
Uh, that's the proportion of times that variable k gets chosen on each of the complementary pairs. Now, the reason for using the complementary pairs is because what goes on on one uh, uh, subsample of size n over 2 is independent of what goes on on its complement. So what that means is that when it, we compute this expectation, of course, these are, this is an expectation of identically distributed things, so uh, we can just think about one of these products of indicator functions, but they're independent, and so the expectation is just the probability of choosing variable k on a subsample squared. And a key point for us is that when k is a noise variable, which is where I'm, I'm interested in thinking about these uh, p, k, n over 2s for now, I expect that the, if it's a noise variable, it should have a low selection probability. So when I square it, this expectation should be really small. Okay, so the, uh, it, it's uh, very likely that this, this random variable will be zero. Of course, there's a chance it'll be one over b, a chance it'll be two over b, a chance it'll be three over b, but these probabilities are gonna be decaying pretty fast because this expectation is so small. Okay, and now we say, well, zero is less than or equal to one minus an indicator function. Uh, when I multiply it by another one minus indicator function, it stays uh, non-negative, and when I average over all these different subsamples, uh, it's still non-negative. And if I multiply out that expression, I get one minus twice the, uh, the pi hat b of k, so the proportion of times that variable k is chosen over all the two b subsamples, plus the pi tilde b of k, the proportion of times I, 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 um, I'm chosen in both halves of my complementary pair. So I want to look at the probability that this uh, that variable k, when k is a noise variable, gets chosen by complementary pair stability selection. That's the probability that this proportion of times it gets chosen is greater than or equal to tor. If I rearrange it using this, this inequality I've got here, I, I get this thing. I just make pi tilde b of k the, the subject of that formula. And now here's the key step in the proof. I apply Markov's inequality. Okay, not a deep result for uh, statisticians. So I've got control of this expectation. I have an exact equality for this. So the probability, this tail probability, is divided, uh, is, is bounded above by the expectation divided by this, this um, two tor minus one. Um, let me just finish the proof and then I'll come back to, to, to that inequality. Uh, so it's probably easiest to start with here. This is the thing I actually want to control for the, for the uh, left, le left hand side of the bound. I can write that as an expectation of the, the sum over all the low selection probabilities of the indicator function of whether or not uh, it gets chosen. In other words, the sum over the low selection probability variables of the, this probability here. Now I can write that um, using my Markov inequality from the previous slide in this way, but then if, I'm, if every k in this sum satisfies this, uh, this constraint, then I can pull out one of these guys as a theta out of the sum, and then the rest of it is just putting this guy back together like that, okay? So it's really not a particularly deep result, but I still claim it's uh, relatively useful. Um, let's think about where we throw something away in these inequalities. So the first is, is when, we, uh, when we use this, this bound here, um, saying that this, this guy is, is non-negative, um, that's not, the, I think, the main place where we're throwing something away. The next place is here, and I think this is really crucial. Because, as I said, this pi tilde b of k, this random variable here, which is supported on the set 0, 1 over b, 2 over b, 3 over b, when k is a noise variable, it's got a very, very small mean, and I imagine it's got, therefore got a high probability of being 0, a smaller probability of being 1 over b, very small probability of being 2 over b, and I'm asking, What's the probability it's at least 0.2, say, if, if, if Tor is 0.6? And so I want to think, therefore, about when do I get equality in Markov's inequality? Well, the equality case would be if I had a big spike on 0 and then a, a sort of smaller spike on 0.2 with the weights adjusted so that I match the expectation correct. Um, but that's not the sort of thing that I expect to see. In fact, I think I've got a, um, a picture here where um, 
So the black is, some, is, is a real, um, is a simulated uh, situation, and you see that you do have quite a big spike on, on, on zero, and then these relatively quickly decaying probabilities, uh, one over B, two over B, and so on. Uh, the gray is, is the equality case for Markov's inequality. And what you can see is that, especially on this blown up version where I'm looking from 0.2 onwards, the, the kind of extremal case for Markov's inequality is putting way too much mass uh, beyond here. So the bound is very weak. Um, and I should be able to do uh, much better so somehow. Um, before I come on to the somehow, uh, I just want to, so, so the only assumption that I have in this analysis is that I've got IID uh, Zs, okay? So if I've got a random design regression setting, that's not a problem. But if I'm in a fixed design situation, this potentially could be a problem because I no longer have IID pairs. But I can sort of get round these bound, the, 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 even this assumption, and I can therefore get um, control of the false selection rate with no assumption whatsoever on my data, just that I have some data. Um, so in order to do that, I need to slightly uh, redefine what I mean by a low selection probability variable instead of being, uh, so, so first of all, if, if I'm gonna try and get rid of the identical distribution assumption, and I can get rid of that if I redefine L, L of theta by saying that um, my PKN over twos are no longer the uh, selection probability of, of variable K, but the average selection probability over all subsets of size N over two. And similarly, if I want to get rid of the independence assumption, I need to redefine the PKN over twos again, or its square, as the average of the simultaneous selection probability over all possible uh, complementary pairs that, uh, that I might choose. Now, if you're a skeptic like me, and someone stands up and says, I can do this with no assumptions on my data generating mechanism whatsoever, I, yeah, I would tend to think, well, it can't be that good a bound or something. <laughs> Um, and I, I think that's probably right, and that actually more useful than trying to remove even this kind of assumption is to try and go in the other direction and think about, well, if I were prepared to make uh, some reason, more reasonable assumptions about what this distribution looks like, then can I improve uh, the bounds that I would get from Markov's inequality and therefore Im improve the, these uh, full selection rate bounds? So the first thing you might think it would be reasonable to assume would that be that the, this distribution, which is supported on this lattice, would be unimodal, okay? I think that it would be very surprising if a particular variable had a high chance of being zero, uh, a small chance of being one over B, and then a higher chance of being two over B. That would be a very, very strange dependent structure that would, would lead to that kind of um, distribution, I think. So if you have um, a unimodality assumption, then you can prove a new version of Markov's inequality for unimodal random variables supported on a lattice. You just plug that into the same um, and, uh, proof that we had before, and you end up with improved bounds for the, for the uh, false selection rate. So the, the bounds of a similar form, you've still got the theta and you've still got this expectation here, but the constant is no longer one over two to all minus one. Um, it's actually, it's, it, there are two different regimes here. Um, essentially, it's a half of what we had before for tor between about a half and three quarters, and then it's actually even better than that for tor between three quarters and one. Um, so that's one improvement you, you might make. And now let's think about um, going back to the same sort of picture we had before. Here, the black is our, our simulated example showing the way that things decay, and now the gray is showing our extremal distribution in Markov's inequality if we assume unimodality. The extremal distribution would again place a large mass on zero, and then it would place uh, non-trivial masses, flat weights from one over B, two over B onwards uh, until some point where it drops down to zero, okay? But again, you can see that's actually quite a long way off the sort of decay that you're, you're seeing, um, at least you're in the same sort of order of magnitude now, but you're quite a long way off what you um, might see in practice. So you might be willing to make stronger assumptions about the way in which this, uh, this distribution decays. And if you know the way that my br brain thinks, you think, well, maybe you could assume it's log-concave, right? Because I've done a lot of work with shape restrictions and log-concavity. This seemed very appealing to me. And in fact, 
uh, if I look at this, this thing that I'd be thinking of be, as being log concave, I mean, it's an empirical average of indicator functions. So uh, if these guys were independent for different j, then it would have a scaled binomial distribution, and that would certainly be log concave. The trouble is, of course, they're not independent, these, these summands. Uh, so, but you might still try and do it. We, we did try, but it turn, turns out that um, in the simulation examples, that's just a little bit too strong an assumption to, to make. It hasn't quite, uh, the, the tail decay is, is assumed is just a little bit too fast. So what we did instead uh, was to work with uh, this constraint called R concavity, which sort of interpolates between unimodality at one extreme and log concavity at the other extreme. Um, the precise definition of what it means to be R concave is perhaps not uh, particularly relevant, um, but I guess um, the, the point is that, that um, the constraint is becoming weaker as, as R is increasing to zero, uh, so uh, that, that's like uh, getting close to, that, that's like the unimodal end, and then uh, R going down to minus infinity is, is getting towards the log concavity end. Um, so Again, you can do this, play the same sort of game. You can prove a version of Markov's inequality for, for R concave random variables. And here is the bound you, you end up with now. Um, again, it involves the, the B. I should have mentioned perhaps before for the unimodal bound. You notice the way that B is, is now entering uh, the, these bounds, as we, we kind of anticipated. Um, and now, now, now the, the bound is a little bit less explicit, but you, you can tabulate this, this bound. and we. we so, so it's not a problem to, to use in practice, it's just you don't have a really nice clean formula for it. We did a lot of simulations with a lot of different data generating mechanisms and a lot of different base procedures. Because of the very simple structure of these summations of indicator functions, it seems that you're not actually that sensitive. The dependent structure is not that sensitive to, to that particular choice. And, and so we were fairly confident in recommending R is minus a half as a pretty safe uh, choice. Uh, you can, you'll be, you're pretty guaranteed that the uh, pi tilde b of k will be um, r concave with r is minus a half. And now you see that the, the sort of extremal distribution is, is much more closely matching um, the, the tail weights you see in practice, and so you're getting a much better bound. Um, this is a quick picture to try to convince you that r is minus a half is sensible. Uh, so if, if, if it's satisfied, then this, these guys should be convex. Uh, in, in this is just one simulation example, so of course I'm not going to convince you totally. If you're worried about this little bit here, well, this is on the probability to the minus a half scale, so we're, we're really talking about tiny probabilities in, in the tail at that point. I'm not really too worried about it. The crosses are coming from the extremal distribution uh, in, in Markov's inequality here. And this is showing the amount of tail weight that's putting be, that's, that, that's going beyond um, two tall minus one, and you can see that with minus a half, you're getting much closer to what you see in practice. One further improvement to the bounds you can make is to try to extend things so that you can um, have control when tor is um, uh, less than a half as well as when tor is bigger than a half. And you can do that by directly, not, not working with pi tilde b of k, but by working directly with pi hat b of k, um, and you can play the same sort of game. Assume it's minus a quarter concave. That again comes from, from simulation examples that we decided that was reasonable. And then you, you get two different bounds here, and, and both are valid if, if both the assumptions are valid here. So you can work with the minimum. And so you, in total, you end up with this picture showing the improvements in the bounds that you get. So here's the, the original bound that, that Nikolai and Peter had. Uh, here's our worst case bound, just a little bit better, no assumptions whatsoever. Here's our unimodal bound, and here's our R concave bound. You can see this, this small kink here. This is where the minimum is, is going from being attained from one factor to the, to the other factor there. And the, 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 the solid line here is showing the, um, this is something you, you see in, uh, from an empirical thing, just showing that the error bound is, is pretty close for a reasonably wide range of tor. Um, uh, this is in no way optimized to try to be as bad as possible. Of course, we want this to work for all uh, data generating mechanisms and all base selection procedures. So uh, presumably there would be uh, choices we could make that would get us much closer to, to this, this upper bound here. Okay, um, how long have I got? A minute or two? Okay, five minutes, well, okay. 
Uh, so here, here's a, a quick simulation study. As I said, we really did a lot of different examples, but I just want to show one uh, to give the sort of flavor of, of the, the results here. Uh, you've got a linear model, and we're, we're going to put a, a turplets design structure on the covariance matrix of the design variables. Um, we're going to assume that, that the uh, signal has got a sparsity level S, and we choose the, 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 let the signal magnitudes in a particular way, uh, so that between minus one and minus a half, and half of them between um, a half and one, and we're going to have N is 200 and P is 1,000. So we'll fix the lasso as our base procedure, and we're going to compare methods that control this, uh, the false selection rate at level L. Okay? And the way that was suggested in uh, Nikolai and Peter's paper to control this at level L is to choose Q, the number of variables you're choosing on each of the subsamples, to be the square root of 0.8 times L times P, and then choose tor equals 0.9. And the reason that works is because you remember you've got Q squared in the numerator of our bound, so that gives us 0.8 times L times P, and then the denominator of the bound, you've got 1 over 2 tor minus 1, and 1 over 2 tor minus 1, that'll cancel the 0.8, and then you, you also had a P on the denominator, so that cancels, and that means that, that you are controlling the, the full selection rate at level L. So, um, uh, so that we, for the worst case bound, we're going to choose tor as 0.9, but we're going to look at uh, other ways you might choose tor. One is to, to use our R concave bound, and another way is to choose an oracle bound that gives exact, uh, the, the, that gives equality here, so we're using the, the, the sort of known simulation structure to do some preliminary simulations, work out what an oracle would choose tor star to be, uh, which is certainly going to be better than our, our tor tilde here, um, unless, of course, our, our bound is in, invalid, uh, and the R concave assumption is wrong, but, but, but it, it's not. Um, and uh, the other thing we'll compare with is just not doing stability selection at all, but just using the vanilla lasso, and we'll give the, the lasso uh, uh, a particular advantage uh, in that we'll, we'll allow that to use an oracle uh, tuning parameter. So that's really quite a big advantage, because that's one of the real... I think the main aspect of complementary repair stability selection or vanilla stability selection is its generality in the sense that you can use it with any base selection procedure and any underlying data generating mechanism. And it's got this attractive feature that you can bound the uh, low selection, the, the average number of low selection probability variables you end up choosing uh, in a way that, and that's something.
as meaningful to, to a practitioner. And so you can, um, you can improve these bounds if you're prepared to make various shape restrictions on, on the underlying distribution, and that allows the practitioner to go back and, and choose the, uh, this threshold in, in an effective way. Okay, thank you for your time. I'll stop there. Yeah, so, so we do have this bound um, on, the, on the other, for the other type of error here. Um, now, this is a worst case bound under no assumption. I think that's quite a weak bound, but, but it, it at least gives you some control there. Um, yeah, I guess you kind of hope that you, you choose a sensible starting base procedure, then if you've got a tight bound on the false selection rate, you shouldn't be doing too badly on the false non-selection rate. Right? That's, that's, I guess, the idea. Uh -huh. uh, well, I suppose, you, yes, I mean, you can just, you can weaken these, you can choose the thresholds as you like to, to, to try to get such sets. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I'm not sure I connect with all the but your all concavity sounds like something that comes up in proving isolated your complex sets. So it turns out these days, it's a set of functions for which I said, you put the measure of the set and you want to prove isolated. Mm -hmm. And it turns out measures that the property in there, the property that F to the one of these convex Yes, uh, uh, one of them, oh, yeah. Then I should go to the impact holes. Mm -hmm. Separating surface and measure of this by convex. Anyway, it comes up in volume computation. Uh-huh, yeah. Whether well, that's related to anything you're doing. It also means that on every line it's really more after you multiply the measure with any other function. So you have a function to fix F to the one of these convex and you multiply it by... What, what's D here? Sorry? What is D? D is a dimension on the set you're sitting in. Okay. You're sitting on D. Okay. Then if F to the one of these convex and you multiply it by the bottom of your function, it's sitting more than one every line. And then I suppose it's the same. Okay. Okay. Let's chat a bit later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, perhaps we should move on to the next speaker, but let's stand up. We have a great.